Well, let me start this morning by showing you one of the most unique church buildings in America. I think we have a picture of it here. One of, excuse me, not one of the most unique church buildings, but one of the most unique buildings in North America. Uh, I found out about this watching a travel show. I like travel programming, and so I found out about this. This is the Haskell Free Library and Opera House, and it is in Canada. And it's also in the United States. The building sits right on the border. If you look at this picture, I think we have another picture here, you will see the, stand, the reading room. Now, to the right of that line, and that line's on the floor there, is Stansted, Quebec. To the left is Derby, Vermont. You can exist in two countries at one time in the Haskell Building. Today we look at a church where it was probably tempting to live in two countries, in two places. The kingdom of God being one country and the kingdom of the world being the other country. Let's stand as we read from Revelation 2 verses 18 through 29. To the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and perseverance. And that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I'll cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations." that one will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord Jesus, speak to us this morning. God, would you work in our hearts? For all of us, Lord, there is a battle ongoing to live in two kingdoms. Lord Jesus, would you help us to see that we are best when we are in your kingdom? Help us to look like you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray, amen. We're going to talk about the problem with dualism this world, uh, this morning, the problem with living in two worlds, or trying to live in two worlds. Thyatira was a church that was living with a very hard choice. Now, Jesus starts off with some praise for this church. He starts out by saying this, I know your deeds, your love, and your faith, your service, and your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. Some, some, some high praise for this church. Let me give you some history on Thyatira. It was once a, militor, a military outpost, but by the time this letter was written, uh, that had passed. It was no longer a military outpost. This is the longest of all of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And that's an interesting fact because Thyatira was probably the least significant of the seven communities named. While no longer a military outpost, it was a center for craftsmen. And these craftsmen operated in guilds that controlled all of the industry in the region. Let's say, for example, you were a maker of wool products which would not have been uncommon in that day. Well, if you're a maker of wool products, if you're going to have any chance at surviving in the industry in Thyatira, you would have to be a member of the Wool Makers Guild. The guilds themselves would have created a real conflict for this early little church in Thyatira. Uh, according to one uh, uh, book, the guilds were closely connected with the Asiatic religion of the place. Pagan, feach, peace, pagan feasts rather, with which immoral practices were associated were held, and therefore the nature of the guilds was such as that they were opposed to Christianity. So you see the choice that they're having to make here? Uh, William Barclay said this. William Barclay said, The problem that faced every Christian in Thyatira was whether they were going to make money or be Christians. 
That's a tough decision to make, isn't it? And yet, that's where they were at. Can you imagine? And it led to this, it led to this sort of devastating issue in the life of the church. If you're in this environment where you have to sort of compromise in order to pay the bills, it becomes very easy, right, to justify compromising. And so the problem that developed over time in Thyatira was a sinful tolerance, an openness to bad practice. Look at what verse 20 says, I have this against you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, Jezebel was probably a nickname given to a woman who was a prophetess at the time. In the Old Testament, if you remember, Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, and she convinced him to turn from the worship of the one true God and worship false gods. So it's likely that this Jezebel was sort of a a statement of who she was. This is a Jezebel, right? I think it's interesting how many times now in the letters to these seven churches, the mixing of sex outside of God's design and religion has been mentioned as a grave problem that's taking a toll. In 2016, Barna did a survey, and I'll just let this speak for itself. A poll of 12,037 people, 57% agreed that whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. of millennials affirmed the statement, and 31% of practicing Christians also did. 40% of practicing Christians agree that any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. 69% of all U.S. adults affirmed that statement. Thyatira was an adulterous church. And when I say adulterous, I'm not just limiting it to the idea of, of sexuality. I'm saying their heart was in two places. Intellectually, they wanted to follow God, but there were things pulling at them to pull them away from God. It was a pro-Yahweh church, but it tolerated things that were anti-Yahweh. Probably sometimes just to survive. They may have said things like, well, that's just the way it is, or if we're going to be a part of this community, we have to accept or tolerate this Jezebel. You know, she's pretty influential around here. If we're going to be influential in the world as a church... We have to look different. We talked about being seasoning last week. We need to look different. We need to be different. The church has to be a holy place. Now, as I was reading that, you know, whenever we talk about sin, our natural tendency is to think of somebody else for a lot of us, right? But the reality is all of us can have this this war going on in our hearts, So as we talk about this this morning, I would challenge us to evaluate things in light of ourselves. Let's commit, church, to being a people that look like Jesus. By the way, that will be uncomfortable, but it will be influential. I believe a church that looks like Jesus in 2023 is going to look radically different from the power structures going on around us in this day and age. It's going to look radically different uh, from the far left and the far right. It's going to be its own thing. It's going to be a people that look like Jesus. Uh, The Bible calls us a peculiar people, strangers and aliens, right? We're going to be a people that don't look like the world. And that may be uncomfortable. One of my favorite, I've quoted Tozer since I've been here. I love Tozer. He's one of my my favorite authors of of the last century. And Tozer said, a Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself, but a spiritual man is easy on others or graceful on others and hard on himself. We, We need to start with ourselves because we really can't control Ned or Lois, can we? We just can't. But we do have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to take our own life and evaluate our own life and say, God, where am I not like you and and where do I need to be more like you? As we start, let me make a point here that's that's probably worth us noticing. I think this is, as I read this passage just last week, and I've read this passage before, but as I read it and kind of reminded myself of some things, something really jumped out at me. Even in the case of Jezebel, God continued to pursue. Okay, even with Jezebel, there's a reality here that we need to embrace. We have a God that's pursuing us in our community with his love. And that's especially true for those of us who are broken and the broken people around us. God is pursuing. 
Verse 21 says this. Remember, these are the words of Jesus spoken through John. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. God was being patient with Jezebel. Right? So can we be patient with those that are broken? And love them? It's a tough one for me. Let me say this this morning. If you're here feeling like, boy, God couldn't love you. Boy, if God only knew what I had done, he would not love me. Well, guess what? He does know what you've done. And he loves you. He loves you, loves you. Like you love your child when your child makes a mistake. He loves you. The term Jezebel still has negative connotations, doesn't it? We don't use it so much anymore. In the old days, she's a real Jezebel, right? Dictionary.com defines it as a wicked, shameless person or woman. Yet again, the words of Jesus, I've given her time to repent of her immorality. Jesus even extended grace. Again, to an extent. At some point, everybody has to decide, and, and, and Jezebel chose the wrong path, but he still offered his grace. All of life is this balancing act between balancing justice and grace. Remember, Jesus is speaking to a church, and he desires holiness in the church. And he also desires those outside of the church, those who are wondering, those who are broken, those who are wounded, those who are struggling, those who are isolated, those who are mired in sin and addiction. He wants them to come to know him too. He loves them. But ultimately, he extends a free will, as he did to Jezebel. So God ultimately honors Jezebel's wish to live apart from him. In a strange way, he honors her choice. She does not want Jesus, so he allows that. We all have a choice to make. Where is my heart? What kingdom do I choose? Verse 22, I'll cast her on a bed of suffering and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely and thus they repent. Repentance is the path forward. The sin in Thyatira is wanting to live in two worlds. It's a question we all have to ask. Who or what are we going to serve? And they tried to choose both, but you can't be with both God and Jezebel. In our world, we'll call it dualism or we'll call it compartmentalizing. It's here where the concept of lordship will guide us today. So, in our Western world, I think there's a tendency to sort of do whatever is in front of us right now, and it, it sort of becomes the most important thing or, or, or the, the most focused thing in our life at any given time. So, sometimes we, we may be focused in on God. We may take time to spend time with God. Those are good times. Those are rich times. I, I know very few people who have ever regretted spending time with God. And we tend to crowd it out of our lives. Now, there's other things we tend to spend time on. We have here a house. And this can represent our things, our stuff, our property. It could also represent our family, our spouse, our children, our grandchildren. All of these things can be very good things, right, in our life. But all of the time, there's this nagging, persistent drive to elevate things above God. Even good things, right? Our family, our children. And whenever we elevate somebody or something about God, what does it become? An idol. And we tend to think of, you know, idols, you know, in the Old Testament are like a a golden cow, right? I really have not a lot of interest in a golden cow. If you brought a golden cow here today, I'd be like, "Eh, that's a nice golden cow, but I'm not super into golden cows, right? But my kids... It's easy for me to sometimes want to elevate them above God. Sometimes we take our, our hobbies. For some, maybe it's sports, either participating or, or watching. For some, it can be our, our other activities, the arts, what we watch on TV, our entertainments. Those things can be good. Sometimes they can actually be bad or unhealthy for us. But again, if we move them above God, it's, it's hard. Not where it was meant to be. And, and, and then there's times, too, you know, we, we, where our, our, our stuff, our money, this could even represent our source of money, like our vocation. I know for me, I'm, I'm far too likely uh, to get my self-esteem from my work. 
instead of realizing that I'm a, a dearly loved child of God created in his image, and because I'm created in his image, I inherently have value. By the way, let me just repeat that again. If you're here today, you are valuable because you were created in the image of God. And nothing you've done can shatter that. God sees you're, you're an image bearer of God. But, but our resources, our things, our stuff, those are things that are easy to, to elevate above God. And, you know, here you had Thyatira with these guilds and these craftsmen and this, this real strong choice that had to be made. And yet we, and it, it seems on its surface such a stark choice. If I don't do this, how will I get by? And, and those may be choices we all face into the future. But I will tell you this, our job is to follow God and let him figure it out. So what, what is the proper thing instead of, you know, some of the time I'm with God, some of the time, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing my family, my kids. Sometimes I'm emphasizing my hobbies, my sports, my entertainment. Sometimes I'm, I'm working for resources and managing resources and whatnot. Well, here's the, appropriate, here's the appropriate thing. We give those things all over to God. Those all become part of our God life. That whatever we think about our stuff, our kids, it's in light of what God is to them. He is over them. He's protecting them. He loves them more than us. That he gave us these good gifts, right? That he is he's Jehovah Jireh. He's this God who, who provides, who, who meets needs. Where everything comes in and under the authority of God. By the way, that can be a very liberating and freeing place. It's a real faith-stretching place. I'll tell you that much. For some of you who have sort of Made those steps of saying, God, I'm going to give you my finances. I'm going to trust you with my finances. I'm going to give more away, and we'll see what you can do. Those can be real stretching, real stretching things, right? We're called to be different. We're called to give everything over to God to be this unique people, and that becomes costly. Consider Jesus' own words to his disciple in, in the book of John chapter 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now, as we've talked, these decisions are hard, right? Some of us hold on. You know, some of us are afraid to, let, to, to surrender control of things in our life over to God. It's scary, right? It's it's frightening. It's worrisome. What if I, you know, God, I'm going to tr trust you with my finances. God, I'm going to trust you with my kids. I tried to micromanage God. I'm going to just trust you with them. Trust you with my marriage. God, with my vocation, I'm going to give that over to you. It's tough. I mentioned when we started this series several weeks ago that each of these churches receives a promise at the end. And here's the promise that Jesus gives to the church at Thyatira. He promises them resurrection life. He says this, Now, I say to you, the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I won't impose any other burden on you. It's as if he's saying, if you, if you stand firm, I'll, I'm going to care for you. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I received authority from my, my father. Then look what he says in verse 28. I will also give, them that, one, uh, I will also give uh, that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For those that step out in faith and say, I'm following you, God, no further burden is imposed. God knows the going may get tough, will get tough. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, right? But he also says this, but behold, I've come to overcome the world, right? It's an amazing promise. We get he uses an interesting phrase here. He goes, you will receive the morning star. You will receive the morning star. When I was a youth pastor uh, for quite a number of years, I used to ask my kids, I'd say, what is the reward 
of having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Most of the time, the answer I got was, well, you get to go to heaven. You get to go to heaven. Which, by the way, is true. I'm not pushing back on that this morning. You have Jesus Christ, you get to go to heaven. But let me challenge you with this idea. The reward of having a relationship with Jesus Christ is this. You get to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The God of the universe looks at you. The God who created Puget Sound and Mount Rainier. Jesus was there at the beginning. And over all of that, the the God who, who makes the wind blow and the oceans roar, he looks at each one of you and he says, I want to be in a relationship with you. A relationship with God is a powerful thing. And if we fully embrace it, if we, if we embrace that idea that God is with us, God is walking with us, God is supporting us, God stands with us, boy, it makes these other things seem much less scary, much less frightening, much less worrisome, right? A relationship with the living God who invites you to come to him every day and give your life over to him, who walks with you there beside you through the storms of life, who cares for you. By the way, who has a magnificent plan for you and wants to see you prosper in this world in unique ways. In scripture, when we see the morning star used, that's a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the morning star. And the promise to Thyatira is, stand firm, you get the morning star, you get Jesus. But here's a challenge. Every day, in little ways, it involves choices. This is a classic case of of being in the world, but not of the world, not taking on the world's demeanor. What might that look like? Well, back in the book of Joshua, the children of Israel are given this really simple question. Joshua asked them this, and it's probably a question we need to ask ourselves with some degree of frequency. Who are you going to follow? That's the choice that the Thyatira church faced. It's the choice that I face every day. It's the, face that you, it's the choice that you face every day. Joshua 24, verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors, the ones they served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Who will you serve? I want to show you a video this morning. 